Right now guys, we're back again for part two of how I painted this wave tutorial. So hopefully you've watched uh, part one, if not, click on that and go back and look at part one. If you sat through that, congratulations, it was an epic journey. And to be honest, this will be too. Um, I did a shorter time lapse of this whole painting if you're actually not really interested in learning to paint the painting and you just want to see how it came together really fast. Um, that's in this whole playlist thing too. It's about three minutes long instead of about an hour ten, which is a bit crazy. But anyway, hey, if you are learning how to paint and you're a beginner, like I was about 14 years ago, Hopefully I'm including some of the tips and the things that I would have liked to have known when I was starting out. The things I couldn't really find about how to paint water, and particularly glassy water in this one, and that splash, things like that. But anyway, we're into the nitty gritty now. This is part two. We've done all the blocking, done a blocking, and to be honest, we're on the, still on the second, second pass. On this painting. This is the time I've done it, a second pass. So this was, this was actually the next day, or the day following the block in. And just working away with those synthetic flat brushes. And we'll talk about brushes as we go on through the video. But um, yeah, there I am. Same deal. Just building on top of that first layer, just coming back um, with some white paint there and slowly just making little adjustments. And now you're seeing me for the first time, you're seeing me using a, that's, that's a sable rigger or a sable round brush, like a number two. And I don't usually do too much of that, but just pulling out some of the, some of the really subtle uh, outlines on this wave around that splash and even trying to, it didn't work. Now, <laughs> that's, that's how much I like using a rigger. So I get onto that, and now I come back with this first time you see me use a palette knife also. So I am just tapping away, tapping away with that palette knife with white paint. And I'm gonna talk more about white paint once we get through this palette knife thingy here. So now the thing about painting nature landscapes and seascapes is you need to be random and being random is actually quite tricky for I think for most of us really and the palette knife really does help with that random those random marks that you know portray nature quite well so here these are this is building up like some of the sparkles that are coming on this wave that I can use, see in my photo so that's how I start doing that with that with that palette knife. Now back with the synthetic flaps. And you're going to see a lot of this. This is how I do it. Working all over the painting. Um, there's that big synth synthetic flap going in now. Actually putting a bit more paint on this time. It's little by little. I don't do any, yeah, I just really gradually build up the lights in this painting. Now, I'm putting on white paint there and I have a confession. Okay, so I am using, there I am using Kremnitz white, which is actually lead white. So lead paint, not very good for you. Um, now, reasoning, reasoning behind this, this is about one of the first times I'd actually used it. And the white, the lead white is transparent. It's much more transparent than titanium white. But, if you're out there and you don't want to use lead white, zinc white is also transparent and has similar properties to lead white. So why don't I use zinc white? Well, because there's an archival um, issue with zinc white, which is only going to affect you if you um, get go down some weird rabbit hole of looking at archival quality of the paint you use and then you get a bit worried about zinc white but I'm sure zinc white's going to be there for a long time um, if you're just you know if you're beginner intermediate 
or even professional and you're not too you don't get too hung up or too scared you know reading forums on archival qualities of paint so but in short in short zinc white i am not an authority of knowledge on paint i just do a fair bit of reading but um, i don't want to advise people but from what i believe zinc white does there's a possibility of zinc white cracking in the future Whereas lead white, obviously lead white stood the test of time. It's on all those paintings that have been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years in those galleries in Europe. So um, lead white is a good option. Um, obviously be a little bit careful. Don't go swimming in it. Definitely don't eat it. Which is, you know, you laugh. You laugh when I say don't eat it, but you want to see the people in here. When I have students here with paint on their face, you know, up around their mouths. So, you know, just don't eat it. Now, actually looking at what I'm doing here. So I've done quite a bit in that little, while we've been talking. But that lead white was very, very good for getting that transparent look. It was much easier than trying to do that with um, a thin down or trying to spread titanium white um, thinly across which I would have done before basically just scumble or glaze which is basically just put that paint on in a very thin layer when I say a thin layer if I was putting that paint over top of a colored surface what I mean is I wouldn't actually cover it. It would be just a transparent, you'd be able to see through it. So, and there's two ways to do that. You can do that with a glaze, and that's basically diluting your paint with a little bit of liquid, so it doesn't, um, so it's not as thick, and therefore it doesn't get the coverage that it does when you leave it thicker, so that's a glaze. It's like a wash, basically just staining your canvas. Um, and the second way is with a dry brush, where you scumble it, basically that means you just spread it around. You scrub it around a little bit until there's not much paint on the surface of your canvas or board. Now, this is the complete opposite when I'm using a palette knife. You see me on the palette knife there again. So that's completely opposite. That's thick paint. And quite white. But not bright white. There's no bright whites going on. I, I really hold back on those bright whites till, till later in the painting. But, you know, that's just the way I do it. I've seen people that go and put their brightest white on early, which I can see the sense in that too. And that gives you a really... I'm a big fan of putting my darkest dark on early. I get my darkest dark on, and then I know that's my range of tonal values from my light to my darkest dark, but I'm really, I'm really cheating myself because I haven't put my lightest light on there yet. But I sort of think I just, I just sort of know it's coming. Um, but maybe if you put your lightest light on and your darkest dark, then you get your total tonal range of value. That can be, you know, that could be a good idea. Maybe I'll try that. So yeah, that's could well happen to me while I narrate and think about what I'm doing here. In depth, as I talk about this with you, you start to think about other things and maybe other ways even I can approach my own painting. Um, and that's how we learn. So just, you know, creating those little fragmented pieces of water coming off that wave. Now, those fragmented um, splashes of water coming off are really, really important to um, this wave. Which leads me to maybe a better way to explain that is uh, if we start to think about a tree. Um, <laughs> what are you talking about, Wayne? We're painting a wave. Now you're talking about a tree. Yeah, so if you're painting a tree in a landscape, it's really, really important that that tree, you get those fragmented branches that, um, so you've got light coming through um, the outer branches of and inside your tree. And it's going to be exactly the same with the edge of that foam you're going to have to have fragmented bits of foam going up, interrupt, interrupting the background. And, you know, even you see some darker bits within that foam. 
those are important guys if you are painting this at home you've got to get those fragmented bits of foam on the edge and you've got to get those darker bits where there's gaps in the foam and you can sort of see through to the back of the wave there and you'll see it in a couple of places on mine those are important things don't miss those and now I'm, look I'm getting serious now putting some paint on I bet you're saying finally because this is going to go on forever but that's little by little subtly build it up it does get tedious um, remembering this is only a four so it's 400 millimeters by 257 millimeters so that's actually that is the golden is it the golden mean that's a golden ratio canvas that is um, one is to 1.618 which we could talk about at another time we won't get into everything today um, but it's a good idea if you know what that is it's kind of a nice size to make your board or your canvas. Carrying on with those fragmented pieces of whitewash. It's so slow, I'm starting talking slow. Um, so I'm going to let this play for a bit. And I'm going to let it play slowly, so if you are at home and you don't want to watch it, fast forward it. If you do want to watch it, it's going to play um, at the same speed. Enjoy the painting.
Okay, on to the third pass now. So what I mean by that is that's the third layer of paint. So um, each pass I put the wet paint on, the wet paint dries, and I come back for another layer. So that's what I mean when I'm referring to first, second, and third pass. Um, I don't really give them fancy names. The first layer is my blocking layer. Then um, after that, you know, I just do another pass, let it dry and do another pass. And there's no set amount of times I do it. And um, obviously we talk about later in the video, I'll talk about how I know when I've finished the painting, because um, you can just go on forever, like I keep on saying. But, uh, so that's what a pass is. And it's much easier, like we've said, you know, um, painting these waves wet over dry in this indirect method is, um, I think it's just so much easier than trying to do it in one wet on wet pass or layer. So you saw me just do a little bit of on the background water there when I first started. And I think that's probably done now. And now starting to get into the very little um, nitty gritty little bits and pieces here. Um, this is when you're going to start to see this wave probably start to look a little bit more realistic, hopefully. And really, what would you be learning? I suppose you'd be learning, A, that, it's, that it takes a lot of time and attention, attention to the details and attention to the, the different colours etc that you see on your reference photo so i probably talked about it already but i think the reference photo a good reference photo is quite important definitely quite important a good reference photo so you don't well i think when you're starting out and even now myself man i prefer to work from a good photo or from life like i do a lot of plein air painting which is brilliant you know but i can't plein air paint this you know, <laughs> this is a this is a split second. This is an absolute split second of um, you know that wave crashing over, and yeah, ironically, we're now spending hours and hours to paint that split second. So you know, but anyway, so plain air is really good for landscape, um, not so good for seascapes. So in that case, you know, get a good photo. I think I might have already spoken about the camera, but yeah, I'm using a Canon 70D and just, um, you know, it's nice, good light, so I get it fast shutter speed and um, take a whole lot of photos, take a ton of photos, and then maybe get one good one. And then there's a little bit, there's a, there's a little bit of um, altering the contrast afterwards. From the initial photo of maybe up the contrast a little bit maybe maybe change the saturation saturation on the, the original photo but really it all changes when you paint it it can you can honestly you can paint quite an average photo and as a painting it looks really good and sometimes you get a really like an awesome photo you think it's going to look great and then you paint it and it's just not so good it just comes from experience what looks good what doesn't and i still don't know actually not every time Sometimes you've got a pretty good guess that it's going to look damn good, but other times you think it could look awesome and it doesn't look quite as good as what you hoped it was going to come out. Anyway, technique. Saw me doing that again, done that in um, the first um, part one. Put a whole lot of mess around with the smaller brush, that synthetic flat, into that foam, putting a lot of that individual little foam and then come back with the, with the larger splayed out synthetic flat and then just sort of um, stipple it all out or stipple it out so you're only seeing little bits of that, those um, foam definitions, definition of foam, splashes. I need better terminology but I don't know what, what terminology there is for foam splashing. I don't know whether anyone thinks as much about foam splashing as what an artist does when they're painting a wave. We might be the only ones that studied foam as much as this. Okay, once again around those, the edges which are quite important and I redefine those edges. 
See the movement of the brush. I spoke about that in part one too. The movement of the brush depicting the movement of the water. And you know, it's quite a fast movement, yeah, quite a loose, fast movement. It really does help. You really want to think about the way the water's moving when you're moving your brush. That there's a very, very small synthetic filbert. So I'm using that now and again, just hardly ever amongst those synthetic flats. Right, we'll let it carry on playing. Hope you're enjoying it. If you're not enjoying it, you would have gone by now. <laughs> I'll catch you in a few minutes. So there we go for the last, what, 10, 15 minutes there. It's essentially, it's been going over the same thing, just really just building up those whites, transparent whites, um, little, little by little. But now, starting to build on the reflection, the sky reflection on the top of this wave as it curls over. Um, so that was that light blue Quite a phthalo blue mix we use in the background there. Um, phthalo blue, burnt umber, ultramarine blue and white. Okay, so remember I said that on um, the first, on part one, I said that you can make a Prussian blue by, if you know what Prussian blue is, um, by using ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, a little bit of burnt umber, and titanium white gets you that color which is in the background and which I was using again on the top of the wave. So that, if you know what Prussian blue is, that's how you make it out of my limited palette. Now, working on this glassy reflective water. So, what I'm actually doing there is that's a reflection of the whitewash of the wave. That's why it's white. In the front of that wave because that's actually reflecting the whitewash um, and that's really cool that's um there's little things you can do when you're painting that really help with the realism 
And that is one of them, actually, is those little reflections, reflections in general, but reflections of whitewash. So I've got some photos. I've got some photos just yesterday. We had a big storm here in Papamoa, and I've got some photos of some nice stormy seas. And I might come at you with another video, if you're enjoying this one, of where it's a, more of a vista of the ocean rather than just um, really focusing on this one little wave. I might do a more broad range sort of seascape, more of a traditional seascape. And when I'm doing that, that's when these reflections will be more important. Well, not more important, but you'll see how they work on a on a larger, well, on a different scale, jeepers. So going back in there and pushing some of those darks that I, that I was talking about just before, those darks back into the white. That's how important they are. So, I can get, so you can work back the other way. Obviously you've seen me working, putting the white on, then I'm going to put some dark back in. So another option. That's why oil paint, so you know, so you're back and forth, you can go light and then you can go back in with the dark. You can just keep on going really. But when do you, how do you know when to stop? Well, actually on that note, I've got some good, how do, how do I know when to stop? That's actually coming up later in the video. So, you know, oh, stay tuned for that. If you're, <laughs> if, you, if you haven't fallen asleep. Um, yeah, yeah, how do you know, how do you know when to stop anyway? That's coming up towards the end. Which, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, the end's not far away really. So the paint that goes on that palette knife, um, it's just a really, really little bit of paint. Um, like, yeah, if you're going to try this, put a little bit on how much you think you'd need and then take half of it off. Then start with that, because it's hardly any paint. Now, so that there is a very transparent little bit of paint going on there to create, to working on that reflection a little bit more. Look, yeah, there's hardly anything going on there, but it does now. Look at that. So uh, here's the fourth pass. So I've done it in four goes. Working back into the dark. Jeepers. I think getting these reflections right was one of the tricky parts. Just get them so they look good. You know, remember to stand back if you're painting. Remember to stand back and have a look at what you're doing. Now, I think we're getting into very near the point. So what I do, guys, going back as how I know when I'm getting close to the end, once I get to about this stage here, so I'm working from an A3 um, photo printout of the painting, of the, of the reference photo, and shortly, I actually start taking, literally just take a photo. There's two ways to do this. The first way, take a photo with your camera. Everyone's normally got their phone on them. Use the camera and take a photo, have your reference photo, then take a photo of the painting that you're doing, and then just bring them both up, and then just flick from one to the other. And when you do that, I don't know, it's just a different way of looking at it. And um, you see, you kind of see it through a fresh set of eyes and you flick from your reference photo to your actual painting and you'll see bits that you want to include and you'll see parts that you, you the parts that you leave out and parts that you'll put in and parts that you don't want and parts that you see that oh I'm going to put that in so you then you go back and you alter your painting again and then you do it again so I do that sort of over and over again you're going to see that coming up and or the other way or the other way to do it is to 
look through your painting through a mirror. So I've got a little, little I think it's a little makeup mirror. I've never used it for makeup, just disclaimer. But I use that for just looking through at my painting. So that's another way to see it through another. When you flip it round, the mirror image, it really does. Anything that's wrong, particularly um, in the actual drawing of your work, in the actual drawing, you'll really notice the difference in the mirror. That'll really stick out. Um, become very apparent when you see it through a mirror if you've made little mistakes. Just say you were doing a reflection of a mountain or a tree and your reflection wasn't vertically below. Because when you do a reflection it has to be vertically below. That's one of the things you can't get wrong. When you're painting landscapes or seascapes the reflection has to be below the thing it is reflecting vertically. And if you were to get that wrong and not notice it um, you will definitely notice it when you look at it through a mirror. That's another little tip. Have your little mirror on you. And here we go, just tapping away with the palette knife and using those synthetic brushes, synthetic flats. So it really has been a painting of synthetic flats um, from uh, various sizes, but, but not real small. I use that sable rigger just a tiny wee bit, and I use that big old synthetic that's all splayed out, all the bristles are now splayed out, and the palette knife. That was what I used to create this, this whole thing. These bits of foam rushing down really give you nice movement to your water. I'll be showing you that in the next in the next video I do. Be a lot of foam. It was a big foam monster yesterday here in Papamoa Beach. Just big foam washing machine. But I think I've got a couple of nice photos. You take about 200 photos, 250 photos, and you flick them through them all, and you get about two good ones. But then, to be honest, you come back in six months time, you have a little look and you find another two good ones, two more good ones. It's, act it's actually quite hard to find a balanced seascape, I think, when you're taking photos. It's a, a stroke of luck, really, when you get a nice balanced photo.
Okay, here we are. I think we're nearly at the end. Just and just defining, going back over little bits, and I've let this play because very soon you're actually going to see me taking that photo with my phone and comparing the photo of the painting versus the photo of the reference or well, the reference photo. I'm sure, that makes sense. Anyway. Um, if you have enjoyed it, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. Hold on, here it is. See? Briefly, and then, just by chance, I caught this on camera. There's me flicking back and forth, looking at, you see it looks quite close to the photo there, but the colours are a bit different. But, you're yeah, fairly close to the reference photo, and then you just, you, you seem to notice the subtle changes, well I do, on the screen of my phone, um, I think it's just fresh eyes. If I go inside and have a cup of tea and come back out half an hour later, I'll probably have the same effect. But anyway, on the spot, if I do that little photo, try that. Just try that when you're painting at home, because that works for me. Um, otherwise, like I said, the mirror. Anyway, well, I was interrupted there. Remember to subscribe to my channel, because that, you know, I'd really appreciate that. And um, share this if you know anyone else who, you know, who's got a lot of time on their hands and learning to paint. Um, share that with them because that'll help me too. And maybe even click the bell because the bell will let you know when I do my next video. And like I said, the next one will probably, I've started already, I've actually started it and it's looking all right. Um, so it's a bigger seascape, broader view of the ocean. Anyway, the little defining touches of paint before we call it done. I need a snazzy ending, but I haven't got one. So all of this, and we're just going to just say goodbye. That's it, folks. That's where I stopped. I don't know why that's where I stopped. Must have just decided it didn't need any more. But anyway, good luck if you are painting something like this or similar. Um, and catch you on the next video. Thanks a lot.